Hello, I'm Sue Nelson and this is the Planet Earth podcast. Last month was the wettest April for more than a century, but England is still undergoing a drought. We examine what's happening to our groundwater and our rivers. There's also news of ice loss in Antarctica, the benefits of bat dung and how to study avalanches indoors. We have a big bucket full of sand right now and we're going to fill the hopper but for that we need to go one floor up because this experiment is pretty big. The phrase April showers more than lived up to its name recently, but that was after government figures showed that Britain experienced its driest March in 59 years. Hosepipe bans remain in place in southern and eastern England and more than 20 million households have been affected. Around the nation, if there aren't flood alerts, underground water and reservoir levels are low, with river flows more typical of those in late summer after a prolonged dry spell. And to discuss the situation, I'm beside a picturesque stretch of the River Thames in Oxfordshire with Jamie Hannaford from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in Wallingford and John Bloomfield from the British Geological Survey. John, you're the groundwater systems team leader. Could you first of all take me through the process of groundwater itself, where it comes from and the importance of our supplies? Groundwater is recharged primarily during the winter months. It forms an important part of the public uh, water supplies but also supports important ecological flows to many of our lowland rivers. And where primarily is groundwater stored? Well, we have a number of major aquifers. There's the Permatriasic sandstones in central and northwestern England, but our major aquifer is the chalk aquifer, which is found in eastern England and central and southern England. And it's stored within the chalk aquifer in the fracture system of the aquifer, and in particular in the normal zone of water table fluctuation where the fractures are preferentially enlarged. And what is the state of our groundwater at the moment? How low is it? Currently, it is really quite low. Latest figures suggest that in many of our observation boreholes, water levels are at uh, historically low levels for this time of year. And how dependent are rivers, including the one we're beside now, the Thames, on groundwater supplies? Many rivers in southern England, particularly on the Chalk Aquifer, are entirely dependent on groundwater supplies, either through springs near their heads and upper reaches or throughout the main course of the rivers and up to 90-95% of flows in chalk streams comes from groundwater. Here at the Thames, well over half of the water that's flowing past us now comes from groundwater. Jamie, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology manages the hydrological programme and it produces his monthly summaries on water availability. Now you collect data from the Environment Agency, but what sort of data do you collect? Not just, I'm assuming, not just groundwater. Yes, that's right. We archive river flow data that's sent from the Environment Agency and its equivalents, so the Scottish Environment Protection Agency and the Rivers Agency in Northern Ireland. But also we take on rainfall data and temperature data and other climatic data from the office and we also take data on from some water companies so reservoir data for example. Now we've just heard that groundwater supplies are at a record low what is the data that you've collected so far showing you about other aspects of our water supply and river flow? The reason why the groundwater is so low is because we've had really low rainfall over a very long period so the data provided to us from the Met Office shows that we've had exceptionally low rainfall in, in, in this part of the world going back really over the last couple of years we had a couple of very dry winters and also some very dry periods between so really it's sort of this very long rainfall deficit is the reason why we're actually we've got such low groundwater levels at the moment and that's also having an effect on the river flows so March river flows for uh, many rivers in southern and eastern England were actually lower than they were um, at at an equivalent time during the the drought of 1976 which is the the big one that everyone remembers. Now one of the problems that I think scientists do have is that for example when the hosepipe ban was brought in there were immediately several weeks worth of rain and so people can't necessarily equate the drought or low water supplies with the weather that we're having. John how long would it take for groundwater supplies to return to what you would consider a safe level? 
Well, groundwater is replenished normally in the winter months, September, October through till March time. So we would need a good wet winter next winter. And one of the things that we're particularly concerned about is what will happen if we see a third dry winter, which would be quite un- well, would be very unusual. And we would be starting to see the response to in aquifers that would be very difficult to understand because we'd start to be reaching the bottom of this developed zone of the water table fluctuation, the fractures that are developed in the water table. Do you have to wait, though, for a a wet winter? Britain is famous for having all sorts of weather at at any time of the year. Could we not have a wet summer that would then restore groundwater levels? We we do see some recharge during the summer, and we know that um, there is a gradual recharge to the chalk throughout the summer, but it's uh, very uh, limited. But we also know that water is always leaving aquifers, it's always flowing out of them, and the rate at which it's flowing out over the summer is almost always greater than the rate at which water can recharge them, because most of the rainfall that we see at this time of year is taken up by plants or disappears through evaporation and never actually reaches the aquifers. So we have to wait until next winter before we really know whether we will get this recharge that we require. Jamie, we know there's a problem, but have you been able to tie it in with any climate change events at all? Or is it even over 10, 20, 30 years, is that still too small a period of time to make a connection? Well, I think you're right there. One of the things we do within the National Hydrological Monitoring Programme is also look at at trends over time. We've been doing a lot of work on this over the last few years. I think you've touched on one of the big issues there, which is that many of our records in the UK are relatively short. The River Thames here down at Kingston in London, there's a record going back to 1883, but that's an exceptional rarity. And most rivers, the records are only back to the 1960s. And as a result, you can look at whether events like droughts or floods are becoming more frequent or more severe, but it's it's really too short a record to determine whether or not that's due to climate change or not because climate models project for the UK generally wetter winters in future and drier summers and yet of course what we've seen recently the drought is caused by drier winters. Jamie Hannaford and John Bloomfield thank you both very much. This is the Planet Earth podcast and you can see some pictures of John and Jamie by the river on our Facebook page. It feels as if it took spring a long time to get there this year, but winter seems to be finally behind us. And for scientists who study the physics of avalanches, you'd assume that any chance of observing the effects of a mass of snow travelling up to 100 miles per hour would also be over. But that's definitely not the case for Dr Natalie Vreend at the University of Cambridge. I went to meet Natalie at the Centre for Mathematical Sciences and found her beside what looked like a big metal foam box leaning on its side. There was no glass, just this rectangular frame, and inside was a narrow conveyor belt on a slope. But there was something familiar falling down that slope, and it wasn't snow. We're doing our experiments with sand instead of snow, because as you can imagine, if you're doing experiments in a laboratory, you want to keep the environmental controls at a certain level that the snow doesn't melt. Now this sand, let me just, you've picked up some in your hand there from a bucket. It's beautifully fine. It almost looks like the sort of fine grain sand you would either have in a children's sand pit or if you were very lucky, an extremely nice beach thousands of miles away. Mm -hmm. The difference between the sunny beach very a thousand miles away and the snow that we find in the cold mountains is actually not that big because both snow and sand are consisting of small particles and these particles when they start to move they interact and collide with each other and because of that the physical processes that occur on this small scale are actually very similar so we're doing the, our experiments with sand instead of snow okay well can you demonstrate to me what you actually do can we turn this huge contraption this conveyor belt of of sand on yes of course i'm happy to oh you're climbing up a ladder here i'm opening a valve that opens the sand flow the sand is being let in at the top of the incline the distance where the sand can avalanche is about three meters long so we bring in sand at the top And it starts to avalanche down. Oh, yes, I can see now some of the sand coming out of a a little tube at the top of the slope, which is just a bit higher than me, so it's a couple of metres high. At this moment, the sand is not flowing very fast. 
what we can do is actually open the valve a little bit higher yeah. so that the scent starts to come out in bigger quantities and then you can see some other features. Okay, let me see if we can hear. I'll put the microphone close to the sand grains coming out. So what you can see now is that there's scent coming down. Oh gosh, it slope. looks like that's really interesting. It looks like your slope of sand, the central bit, now looks like a sort of flowing molten river of sand. Indeed, indeed. And if you look very carefully, you can see that the middle part is flowing very fast, but there are bits on the side, like oh, dikes. Oh yes, that's sort of turning round and not moving so much. Exactly, and, and there are actually sand grains that are static or not moving at all. And is that what happens when snow goes down a slope? Exactly the same way you get the, a fast, the central moving bit and then the bit that almost looks like eddies at the side. Yes, indeed. When a mass comes down a mountain, it goes the fastest in the middle and it, the velocity goes further to, to zero towards the side. And therefore, you, if you look very carefully at deposits in the mountain, you can always see that the snow kind of carved its way through a deposit and left debris on the side. We have a big bucket full of sand right now and we're gonna fill the hopper but for that we need to go one floor up because this experiment is pretty big. Yeah. So we need the elevator because I don't want to carry the sand all the way up. So we're going in the elevator right now right, with this big bucket, bucket of, of sand, sand which is on a sort heavy. of a small trolley. We're on our way to fill the hopper from the top on the next floor up. And there's a little um, filling basket. Open the door, wheel the sand out. And now we're looking down on the conveyor belt slope of sand and what looks like an upturned traffic cone Indeed. at the top, an orange home where you're going to shovel in the sand. So this goes scoop by scoop. And then you can release it down at the yes. bottom when you want it to study. Indeed. We're able to close the valve and open it again at will. So we can just fill the entire hopper with scent and then start our experiment. How did you choose the angle of your slope? Is there a sort of an optimum angle that avalanches tend to occur? The angle that avalanches usually occur is between 30 and 45 degrees. And that's actually pretty steep. It's much steeper than you would ever drive on. The reason is the following. If you have angles lower than 30 degrees, the sand would not start to avalanche, or the s snow would not start to avalanche naturally. It will, will just stay there and be static. If you go to angles higher than 45 degrees, in the n uh, natural environment, in the mountains, you would not have the case that there is enough snow on the ground to have a big mass release. Because as the snow falls from the sky, it will just naturally start to fall down before it can accumulate to form a big avalanche. OK, so we'll pop back downstairs now and um, yes. take a look and see what's actually happening on the ground. As you can see, the sand is avalanching down again. And let me change the flow rate right now, because then you can see some other features as well. Okay. So I'm now reducing the flow rate. In other words, there's less sand per minute coming out of the hopper. Okay, what oh, do you see gosh, now? Oh gosh, that's interesting. Instead of a flowing, free-flowing river, it, it was almost like a drop of treacle. So in this case, Go because on. we reduced the flow rate, there's not enough sand coming through to form this continuous river. Because of that, the sand accumulates at the top of the incline and just starts to avalanche. The slope fails when there's a, a certain amount of sand available. So you get these intermittent avalanches, and they almost look like tongues going down the incline. So it's probably more like when you see on films as well, when you see avalanches happen. It, that's how you see them, this moving, almost like lava, yes. but snow. If you look very carefully and follow one as it comes along, you can actually follow the tip of the tongue. Oh, yes. And you can see that there's a lot of motion in it, this tip of the tongue as well. Oh, yes. So the, grains the grains are moving like mad there and then yes. slower at the end, almost like a sort of slow motion comet there. Indeed. Oh. What do you hope to learn by studying 
this flow, this avalanche of sand, further than what's already known already about avalanches and how and why they occur? Because a certain amount is known already. It is really difficult to understand exactly what's going on because if you can imagine, if you have a flow of water down an incline, researchers know pretty good how to investigate water down an incline. If you have a solid material, the physical laws are very well understood as well. In this case, you have this odd mixture of different phases. In other words, you have sand that, as, as you look in the middle of the river of sand, it looks like a flowing stream, and it goes very fast, and there's a lot of motion going on. But if you look at the side of the river, it's static. So you both have fluid and solid properties that are combined in one, and that's really hard to model. So the bigger picture is that we want to understand where the avalanches are going, how far they get, and how forceful and how big they are, what kind of pressures occur in them. The reason is, is that we want to understand where we can build buildings and roads and where it's safe for people to live. In the past, people relied on historical records, but they may not be very accurate anymore because the climate is changing, so... You know, snowfall and temperature are changing as well. And the second reason is that not at every point in the world we have historical records. So we want to be able to model snow avalanches from a physical point of view to actually be able to apply to every valley and every mountain site in the world. For that, you need to know the physics and really understand the physics. And therefore, we're doing this type of research. Natalie Vreen from Cambridge University and you can see a photo of her sandy avalanche simulator on the Planet Earth online Facebook page. And there's more news from the natural world now with environmental journalist Tamara Jones. And you're going to begin with news of ice in Antarctica. Ice sheet loss specifically, yes. Well, an international team of researchers led by scientists from the British Antarctic Survey have worked out why we've been seeing so much ice sheet or ice loss from Antarctica in recent years and they say that what's going on is that the warmer ocean currents kind of hitting the underbelly of ice shelves now ice shelves are the bits of ice that sit completely on the ocean they normally act as like a kind of buttress so they slow down glaciers that are coming from the continent meeting the sea now if you've got ice sheets being melted away by warmer water they're going to be thinner and they're, they're going to degrade which means that the glaciers are going to hit the ocean or speed up towards the ocean in fact Hamish Pritchard, who was a member of the team, in fact said that. So in most places in Antarctica, they could see a clear pattern. In all cases where ice, sheets, ice shelves are melted by the ocean, the inland glaciers are actually speeding up. Wow, so this is coming from beneath warmer waters, direct evidence then of, of seeing how these ice sheets melt. I mean, this is a pretty important finding, it is, because some researchers have kind of thought, well, maybe it's the warmer air that's driving these um, glaciers to speed up towards the ocean. Now, in the West Antarctic Peninsula, which is a kind of a bit further north, that's not the situation at all. But in the main part of Antarctica, that is actually what's happening. And Hamish said that in most places in Antarctica, we can't explain the ice sheets thinning through the melting of snow at the surface, so it has to be driven by warmer ocean currents melting them from below. And indeed, that's exactly what they found. And that research recently reported in Nature. Moving on to bat dung now, as you do, and the benefits of bat dung. This sounds pretty unusual. Yeah, well, a bunch of researchers at the University of St Andrews have used um, bat dung in caves in Southeast Asia to work out what our climate was like many, many years ago. And they've used it to figure out... um, why, for example, you've got two different types of orangutans in um, Southeast Asia between in Borneo and Sumatra. The way they do this is they're looking at um, within the bat dung, they've got insect exoskeletons that they last a really, really long time so they don't degrade. And those exoskeletons can they also record the chemical composition of the plants those insects would have been eating. So, in that way, you can figure out what the vegetation was like, and then from there, you can then figure out what the climate was like. So, it's quite a long winded process. So, it's like sort of layers of, of going down, sort of yeah. one to the other, and all from bat from dung. dung. Absolutely, yeah. And of course, it has to be incredibly deep because it's you know, it's built up over years and years and years and years. And I think in some 
cases they're looking back sort of 40,000 years or so, which is, yeah, a long time ago. So they must have an awful lot of bat dung then. Yes, it is. And it's incredibly noxious um, stuff. It's like when they go into the caves, the ammonia is so powerful, you've got to wear gas masks to uh, cope with the situation. And what have they discovered then about the climate and, and how it relates to the different type of orangutans in the area? Well, what they've worked out is that the climate would have supported a kind of savanna type environment around Sumatra and Borneo, which suggests that the orangutans might not have been able to get between the two islands because they completely rely on rainforests to, to get about. Now, that is a new finding because you might assume that years ago it would have all been rainforests, in which case they would have been able to get between the two islands, but... That's not the case at all, according to this new research. Tamara Jones, thank you very much. This has been the Planet Earth podcast for the Natural Environment Research Council from the banks of the River Thames in Oxfordshire. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page and our Twitter feed. I'm Sue Nelson. Thanks for listening. <laughs>